Hello and welcome to Cabrillo Marine Aquarium's Tide Pool Talk. Over the course of this video, you will hear different voices from our education team describe the living and non-living factors that make up the unique habitat of the Point Furman Tide Pool area. Free maps of the Cabrillo Coastal Park are called Walk Cabrillo and can be downloaded from the aquarium's website or picked up from the information booth or gift store. The map is a walking tour of the area that includes the inner and outer Cabrillo Beach, Salinas de San Pedro Salt Marsh, the Native Garden, fishing pier, boat launch, and the Point Furman tide pools. All of this is within easy walking distance of Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. The Point Furman tide pools are affected by the daily rising and lowering of the tides, but what causes the tides? The simple explanation is that the gravitational pull from the moon and to a lesser degree the sun create bulges of water towards the celestial bodies and opposite of the celestial bodies. As the earth rotates through these bulges, the Point Furman tide pools experience two different sized high tides and low tides, called semi-diurnal tides, every lunar day. Each tide is about six hours apart. When the moon, earth, and sun are lined up during new and full moon phases, the celestial bodies combine their gravitational pulls. This creates the highest high tides and the lowest low tides of that lunar cycle. Due to the shape and depth of our shoreline, the Point Furman tide pools experience a maximum tidal fluctuation of about 8 feet. Other areas of the world experience much greater or much less fluctuation. Scientists can predict the tides far into the future and create tidal charts for us to use for navigational and recreational purposes. When is it the best time to go tide pooling? Usually around the new and full moon lunar cycles, about a half hour to an hour before the low tide. The Point Furman tide pools can be accessed by a trail along the base of the cliffs and has a long and interesting natural and human history. The location that we call the bunker is not actually a bunker, but an old and crumbly saltwater swimming pool built in the 1930s. There is also a wall-like structure that historically held the stormwater outfall pipe from 40th Street. The pipe has since been trimmed to empty into the sandy sediment, leaving the wall behind. The cliffs above the tide pool area and the sediment in the tide pools is mostly ancient seafloor and part of the Monterey Shale layer aged between 7 to 14 million years old. This sedimentary rock formation crumbles easily and visitors are advised to take care when walking close to the cliffs, in addition to the bunker and the rock wall. This is a picture of the Point Furman tide pools during a high tide. Note the location where the water is in relation to the land and how many rocks are visible. This is a picture of a low tide in the Point Furman tide pool area. The term tide pool refers to the pools of water in and around the rocks left behind by the receding tide. Some animals use these pools to survive at low tide, while other animals can survive exposed out of the water. Note the location of where the water is and how many rocks are exposed at low tide. Because of the changing tides, you can expect to find certain organisms living in the spray, high, mid, and low tide zones. Where an organism lives depends on its needs and limitations. Some things to consider would be how long can it stay out of water, exposed to the sun and wind? Where is its food? Where are its predators? As well as the availability of space. Tide pool organisms have adaptations that allow them to survive despite the ever-changing conditions. Let's check out some of the coolest and most common organisms that we find on our coast. One of the few true marine plants growing in our tide pools is surf grass. If you notice, it has tiny bubbles all along its leaves. That's just some of the oxygen it's producing through photosynthesis. More common in the tide pools than true plants are algae. There's feather boa kelp, which is strong and flexible, making it able to withstand the crashing waves. It also has its very own limpet that lives and feeds along the site. Giant brown kelp at times washes up into the tide pools, bringing with it nutrients, shade, and maybe some small stowaways. And lastly, coralline algae. Depending on the kind, it can be encrusting or branched, and when alive, ranges in color from pink to red. This algae has calcium carbonate inside the body, making it hard, although not impossible, for grazers to eat. Anemones are a common type of animal to see inside the tide pools. Like jellies, they use stinging cells to paralyze prey. Using the ring of tentacles surrounding their mouth, they sting pretty much any unlucky organism that gets too close. They pull the food into their body to be digested. Because they only have one opening, 
Whatever they can't digest, like shells and bones, gets pushed right back out. They're highly adapted to life on shore. These boneless animals use small shell and rock fragments to deflect sunlight during low tide and spread out the impact of wave force as the water comes back in. If you come across an open anemone, gently pass your finger along the tentacles to feel their steam. For most humans, it feels like sticky tape. If you come across a closed anemone, it may be digesting a meal or conserving water inside its body until the tide returns. Please refrain from touching these ones as they may throw out the water that's necessary for their survival. Another animal you may find when exploring the tide pools is a sand castle worm. And more than likely, if you see one, you'll see many. As sand castle worms mix together cement and sand to build large formations of tubes that can grow higher than six feet. During low tide, they close a trap door called an operculum to keep from drying out. During high tide, they extend their tentacles to capture passing by food and sand particles. Some of these sand particles, they even choose to save in case they ever need to rebuild their home. Please note there are other tube building animals in the tide pools. Stay tuned for a look at the scaly tube snails a little bit later. Chitons are a mollusk that may seem to look like a strange imprint. Sometimes people think it looks like a fossil. They are a live animal with a segmented shell and a soft body underneath, protected very well by pulling their shell down over them and settling into a home scar they develop in a rock. During a high tide, they will move around grazing on algae. During a low tide, they are usually stuck very tightly to the rocks in their home scar. Periwinkle snails are a small snail that prefers to live in the higher splash zone areas. They don't want to be submerged in water and may congregate together. You might find at least a few, if not many like you see in these pictures, huddled together in drier areas of the rocks and crevices. There are many different kinds of snails in the tide pools. These are a few of the most common. The chestnut cowrie can be easily identified by its smooth orange and brown shell. Chestnut cowrie are known to feed on algae as well as soft corals and sponges. The Norris top snail is an athletic, fast-moving snail that is known to travel the length of the giant kelp, typically feeding on the fresh growth edges at the top of the kelp at night and traveling back down to the lower parts of the kelp during the day. In the tide pools, they might be seen feeding on other algae or where giant kelp is thriving. Turban snails are very common in tide pools. You will find them congregating around algae like you see here, gathered around the kelp and probably eating it. When this animal dies, the shell becomes a possible home for hermit crabs. Any size of an empty turban snail shell, from the tiniest shells to the larger specimens, can all be a popular home for hermit crabs as they grow through their life cycle. Just like many snails, chitons, and limpets, turban snails, even though they are one of the smaller species of snail, can live to be quite old. A larger turban snail might be 10 to 15 years old. Scientists can age many types of snails by studying the growth markings on their shell. Wavy top snails have a very unique shell. It spirals and also displays wavy edges. They are a species that can grow to be large, the size of a softball or even the size of a medium grapefruit. They have a strong, thick shell and operculum or trapdoor that helps them survive against predators like the octopus and the predatory Kellett's whelk snail. Snails have an interesting mouth and feeding apparatus that we call a radula. Essentially like a conveyor belt of teeth, it helps them scrape algae from the rocks or helps them consume larger, tougher pieces of algae, scraping it into smaller bits to eat. Large and small snails have radulas, from abalone and limpets to chitin and periwinkle snails, and brown and black sea hares. It is how many gastropods eat their food. 
Scaly tube snails are a colonial snail that many times live together in small bunches and sometimes in larger colonies. They can colonize a rocky surface or other surfaces like shells of other snails. They use mucus to create a net to catch planktonic floating food when the tide is high and swallow their net to digest any microscopic food they catch. They are an animal to look for that sometimes goes unnoticed. Try looking for macaroni type shells in and around the rocks. There are many species of abalone along the Pacific West Coast and in fact around the world. Five species of abalone are unique and native to Southern California. The green, black, pink, red, and white abalone. The taking of any abalone species in Southern California is prohibited. In addition, the subtitle or deeper water white abalone and the intertidal black abalone are listed endangered and protected under the Endangered Species Act. Abalone, like the green abalone on the left and the black abalone on the right pictured here, are both possible species to see in our tide pools. They are found in mid and lower tidal zones along protected rock crevices. If you see an abalone, make sure not to disturb or move them. Slight injuries to their body can be fatal to the animal. Do observe, take pictures, and perhaps use those pictures to help identify the species you saw. There are a variety of different limpet species found in the tide pools. We can see a variety of smaller limpets in the far left slide, the most commonly seen species. They will live all over the rocks, on other animal shells, and on each other's shells sometimes too. The owl limpet is seen in the mid to low tide zones. They average from one and a half to two and a half inches long at maturity. Owl limpets have interesting behaviors like clearing the space around their home sites to help maintain space for algae growth, their favorite food. True limpets in general are born male and changed to female as they grow in size. Loss of larger animals, which would all be reproductive females, can deplete the owl limpet population's ability to reproduce. For many animal species, but particularly most snail species, removal of large, reproductively important animals causes declines in populations. Scientists studying local owl limpets determined that this little animal, about the size of a vanilla wafer, can live up to 30 years. Not a true limpet, the giant keyhole limpets share the limpet name and shell shape. They are the least common to see in the tide pools. A larger bodied animal about the size of a mango when full grown and with less of a shell covering than other snails. They will live deeper in the low tide zones in crevices or pools to stay protected. By pulling in their mantle and body tightly, they can use their shell to protect against heavy wave action or certain predators. Not exclusively an herbivore, they are known to feed on a variety of small organisms found in the tide pools. Brown sea hares can be seen in mid and low tide zones, grazing around in the tide pools of red algae. They also have the ability to ink, usually when threatened or injured, and can release in mucus-like purple ink. Sea hares have a short life cycle and live for approximately one year. They are hermaphrodites and lay eggs like other sea slugs. Here you can see the distinctive orange strands of eggs that will darken over the next nine days and are ready within 10 to 12 days to hatch into free floating plankton for the next phase of their life cycle. Mussels are a bivalve that you can find typically in the mid to low tide zone, in that sweet spot where they have some relief during low tide from their most common ocean predator, the predatory sea stars. Living in an area of heavy wave action, sometimes on flat rock surfaces, they use their bissel threads, like you can see here in this photo, to create strong attachments to the rocks. 
Scientists are studying the properties and structure of these Bissell threads in an attempt to engineer substances that are equally as strong. When the tide is out, the mussel is keeping their shell closed so that they can stay moisturized. When the tide comes up over top and a high tide reaches them, they will open their shell so they can filter feed. They do this with two siphons or tubes, one to bring in water containing the oxygen and hopefully good plankton to eat, and the outgoing siphon to release anything that they cannot digest and their respiratory waste. We can find mussels growing individually or in small clumps starting in the mid-tide zones. In a very healthy rocky shore environment, we would expect and hope to see large mussel beds as well. Growing in these colonies protects the mussels and makes it easier and more successful for them to reproduce through their spawning method. The mussel beds also give a buffer from wave action as the many shells of the mussels clumped together will provide some protection to the network of attached Bissell threads underneath. Mussels can make new Bissell threads and reattach, but being totally dislodged from their living site can result in that animal not surviving. Mussel beds also create microhabitats, crevices, and additional surface area for other animals that might live in and around the mussel beds. Small crabs, many small limpets, barnacles, and even algae will grow on and around them and in between. They make a great place to hide and increase the surface area for some animals like barnacles and limpets to live on. If you've ever seen rocks that look like Swiss cheese, or ever seen rocks spitting at you in the tide pools, you may have been encountering the evidence of boring clams. Boring clams are anything but boring. They are very adapted to living in a challenging environment. Like other bivalves, of course, they're filter feeders. They have two shells and two siphons, one to bring water and nutrients in and one to remove wastes. But when their shells close suddenly, they may spit out excess water. The outside of their shell is modified with rough teeth-like files around the lower part of the shell to help them carve or file away at the rocks that they live on and in. They are most often responsible for those Swiss cheese rocks or deep holes in rock fragments that you might find around the tide pools. Octopus are an apex predator in our tide pools, and their ability to camouflage, to move into small spaces, their excellent eyesight, and eight arms that are equipped with individual ability to sense chemicals of their prey in the water, gives them the advantage in the rocky shore landscape. This cephalopod that can change colors, produce ink, and are proven to be incredibly flexible and intelligent problem solvers might be motivated by food and sometimes by their curiosity to explore the area around them. Both female and male octopus only reproduce once in their lifetime, at the end of their life cycle. There are many food sources to match a young octopus as it grows in size. It will find matching prey throughout its life cycle in the tide pools, such as crabs, snails, shrimp, lobster, and sometimes fish. A resident tide pool octopus may spend time in their den, but are also frequently seen exploring within the tide pools, finding food, moving from tide pool to tide pool, and often spotted camouflaging in plain sight. If you do spot a small or larger octopus in the tide pools, give the animal some space and enjoy observing. Barnacles are one of the most common animals in the inner tidal. They are crustaceans and are related to lobsters, crab, and shrimp. Barnacles are sessile, meaning they do not move and are attached permanently to the substrate. Acorn barnacles are quite small, reaching up to eight millimeters in diameter and are brownish gray and can be found scattered all over the rocks, on pier pilings, and even on other hard-shelled organisms. 
pink barnacles are also called thatched or volcano barnacles and are a bit bigger than acorn barnacles, reaching about 30 millimeters in diameter. Another type of barnacle is the gooseneck barnacle, also called the goose barnacle or the stalked barnacle. They are also sessile, but have a fleshy stalk attached to the rock. They are usually found attached in groups or clusters, often mixed in with the California mussel. Please be careful while walking on the rocks to not twist your feet too much as you can damage or injure barnacles. Hermit crabs are another really common crustacean that lives in the tide pools. They use empty snail shells as protection and can retreat quickly inside the shell if disturbed. The tail appendages of the hermit crab are modified into hook-like structures that cling to the shell firmly. As a hermit crab grows, it is necessary for it to find a larger snail shell. Once they come across a prospective shell, they inspect it very thoroughly before changing shells. Because hermit crabs cannot always find an available and suitable shell, anything hollow can be used until they find something better. This is why it is so important to leave empty shells at the beach as they may become homes for hermit crabs. It is always best to handle them gently and then return all animals and shells to the tide pools. The striped shore crab is a small crab that has a brownish purple or black carapace with green stripes and is about four to five centimeters wide. The claws can be red or purple and the legs are typically purple and green. They can come completely out of the water and crawl on the rocks, but need to submerge once in a while to wet their gills. Typically they hide in small crevices within the rocks, but will come out at night when there is less chance of predation. They are opportunistic feeders and will eat almost anything, ranging from algae to snails and mussels to other crabs. Predators include gulls, octopus, raccoons, and humans. While exploring the tide pools, if you find something that looks like an empty hollow crab or a piece of a lobster tail, you most likely found a molt, which is the exoskeleton of that animal. All crustaceans have an exoskeleton and shed this hard outer shell periodically in order to grow. Molts typically look more pale in color than the live animal, and after close examination, you will notice that there are no internal structures or tissue inside. So the animal is likely still alive somewhere, it is just a little bit bigger. Sea urchins can be found in many of the tide pools, especially in the lower tide zone. The purple urchin is the most common type, with the larger red urchin being found occasionally in our tide pools as well. Urchins belong to a group of animals called echinoderms, which means spiny skin, and as you can see, they are covered with big spines. The spines are not venomous, so they are not dangerous to touch, but can break your skin if handled roughly. Sometimes you will find a sea urchin skeleton, or test, which looks a bit like a greenish-white donut. The bumps on the skeleton would be where the spines are on the living animal. One of the most iconic and recognizable animals in the tide pools is another echinoderm called the sea star, or starfish. There are several types of stars that can be found here, the most common being the ochre star, which actually comes in different colors, including purple and orange. Knobby stars are brownish stars with blue rings around their spines. The bat star has skin growing between its five arms, giving its body a bat wing appearance. The number of stars along our coast has dropped recently due to a disease called sea star wasting. Their numbers in some areas are just now starting to recover. There are other types of echinoderms in the tide pools, but they are harder to see as they tend to hide in and under rocks and stay deeper. The brittle star has five arms like a regular star, but its arms are very skinny and snake-like. If handled roughly, it can break off its arms like a lizard breaks its tail off. Like with other stars, the arm can be regrown after it's been lost. The warty sea cucumber can have large spines on its skin and looks dangerous to handle. However, the spines are rather soft and squishy, and the cucumber can squeeze into small cracks and crevices. When threatened, the cucumber can eviscerate itself, throw up its guts. This distracts the predator, allowing the cucumber to crawl off and regrow its internal organs. Tide pool sculpin are great at camouflage. If you are patient and look closely in a tide pool, you may find a few fish holding very still at the bottom. Juvenile opali can sometimes be found in some deeper pools. 
They will stay in the tide pool area until they are large enough to survive in the kelp forest. All storm drains lead directly to the ocean. Unfortunately, trash and waste make their way into the storm drain system. There may be high concentrations of bacteria in the water near storm drain outfalls. Please stay 100 yards away from them when you visit the beach. After a rain, make sure to avoid contact with the ocean water for three to four days. Beach cleanups are a solution to trash on the beach. However, it is best to prevent trash from getting into the storm drains in the first place. When exploring the tide pools, it is best to walk at all times. Make sure to stay on the dry rocks since the wet rocks will be very slippery. Remember to step lightly. There are live animals underfoot. Please make sure to use a gentle one or two finger touch on the animals present in the tide pools. If you decide to pick up an animal, make sure to return it to the same place you picked it up from. Lastly, be sure to only take memories, photos, and trash. The tide pools are a wonderful habitat for everyone to explore and discover all of the sea life that makes this special place home. From all of us at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, we hope you enjoy exploring the tide pools. Thank you for watching.